Welcome. How nice to see everybody here. Uh, I should be very brief. Uh, I'm Roly Keating. I'm Chief Executive here at the British Library. Uh, and everyone, guests and audience, are extremely welcome to Comic Connections. Uh, and we have an extraordinary program to accompany Comics Unmasked uh, around the corner. But secretly, I think we think tonight may be the highlight of the whole uh, season. Very lucky to be here. And uh, uh, not just this bit, but what's going to happen uh, uh, all over the building uh, tonight. I, I suspect the exhibition doesn't need huge introduction. Uh, you, you've either seen it or you're about to see it, I hope. Uh, it's called Com not just Comics Unmasked but art and anarchy in the UK, and there is great art and great anarchy under the roof of the British Library, I'm pleased to say, tonight. Uh, its curators, uh, or two of them, are with us tonight, Paul Gravett uh, and John Harris Dunning. I'll be handing over to them uh, in a minute. They put the show together uh, with my colleague here at the Library, Adrian Edwards, our head of printed historical sources, which gives you a clue, I hope, about the range uh, of the exhibition we've put together here at the Library. Everything that human culture tries to print and produce, we try to collect. And the glorious tradition of graphic novels, comic art, dating back not just decades but centuries is something we've always collected here. But until now, we've perhaps not brought it center stage and given it that scholarly, obsessive care and attention we love to give to everything else. And I hope we're remedying that uh, with a vengeance this summer. Uh, so we've drawn extensively on our own collections here with some fantastic loans. Uh, everything from an extraordinary 15th century uh, illustrated apocalypse, possibly the first comic strip we have, uh, right up to 20th century material, remarkable manuscripts uh, for Kick-Ass, Viva Vendetta, Tank Girl, other 20th century and 21st century uh, classics. Uh, and uh, uh, including, of course, fantastic exhibits um, from at least one of our speakers tonight. Uh, accompanying that, directly after this, uh, if you have the wristband, you are in to Late at the Library, uh, where we have an evening of celebration and performance around the exhibition. Uh, the artistic director uh, of the exhibition, uh, the great Dave McKean, uh, is revealing his Renaissance skills by performing music as well. Uh, also on stage will be Mark Almond uh, performing, uh, Alex Tucker, Pam Hogg is guest DJ, uh, and there'll be free entry uh, to the exhibition there. That is to come, but for the next hour, hour and a half or so, our theme is comic connections. Uh, we have an encounter, uh, I think a unique encounter, uh, certainly here under this roof, and it's a wonderful one between two very remarkable uh, creative people. Uh, Tori Amos, uh, who is wonderfully breaking uh, on one of her rare nights off from her current European tour, uh, will be here a little later, uh, uh, breaking from basking in the glory uh, of the, uh, the praise that's been heaped on Unrepentant Geraldine's, her new album, to reflect on other connections between music, comics, and other kinds of creativity. And her interlocutor and our first interviewee uh, will be, of course, Neil Gaiman, who I think needs very little introduction for anyone who cares at all about the fantasy imagination in literature and on the page uh, and in the brain and the heart uh, of the great British tradition and seeing how it continues uh, uh, under his, uh, the spells that he weaves, uh, whether it's on the pages of Coraline or the screens of Doctor Who, uh, my kids I know worship. Neil and are, and are thrilled that he's here tonight. Uh, but he is here tonight in remarkable circumstances, having just flown in um, from visiting the UNHCR refugee camps in Jordan, home to thousands of people from Syria at the moment. So the world of the imagination and the world of reality feed off each other all the time, and I'm sure that will be one of the themes tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here tonight. Thank you for coming. I am going to hand over now to uh, our two curators and two hosts for the evening, uh, Paul Gravett and John Harris Dunning, to take things from here. Thank you very much. Please welcome Neil Gaiman. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I'd like to have you here, and, and, and extraordinary circumstances, just in terms of the British Library, for one thing, doing so much for comics, which is perhaps a, uh, a surprising thing to, to, to find. Uh, We're definitely in the future that I hoped for. It seems to be coming I, true, I, doesn't it? it it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember... Um, We've stormed the, the, the bastions. Well, one yes. of them, one of them, at least. 
It's that peculiar feeling that we may have won. <laughs> um, and now what? Now what do we do? Yes. I, I, I mean, Paul and I have known each other now for about. Is it about pushing thirty, 30 years? years? It's about thirty years. Yeah. And yeah. he was actually my. More or less, my first comics publisher. Yeah, I like um, that. I wear that with pride. Yes, yes. Well, I, almost because you would have been, been published by that, that this, this magazine that never happened, the Hunter Tremaine Borderline, yep. which lived up to its name, being a bit borderline. It was borderline. It? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> it didn't yeah. happen. But that was your connecting um, place with McKee, I think, wasn't it? That so, was where yeah. Dave and I uh, we went to the offices of uh, this this uh, Wimpole Street offices of this comic, which turned out to be a. Uh, telephone sales company from which he'd like been fired but still had the key so he could get in. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and it, it was there very, was very, very kind of smooth suited operator types there, weren't there? Very, I mean, we were, we didn't, this isn't really comics people. I didn't it think, was very uh, strange. But you came down and you, yeah. you liked what I was writing and you liked what Dave was drawing and we came over to you and, and we said, and I think you said to us, would we like to do a, you know, five page strip yeah, for short, escape? Just a short, something short. And we yeah, came back to you magazine, actually. for Escape magazine, here. Yeah. and we we came back to you. That was that was that Escape, was yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. we came back about a week later and said, "You know that that five page strip you invited mm. us to do? Would you mind if it was a forty eight page graphic novel called Violent Places?" <laughs> <laughs> and what did you say to that? Obviously, uh, um, no, don't do it. No, it has to be five pages. No, of course, it was wonderful. You said yes, but obviously something in the in that period had really gestated. The two of you, you and David, really hit it off, and things were clearly you know, growing in a way that you hadn't expected, perhaps. I think a lot of it um, was we both there were there were comics that we wanted to show people that didn't exist, yeah. Yeah. and it was that thing where I'd realised that I would be talking to people about comics, and they were not seeing what I was seeing in my head. As far as I was concerned, it was like comics was this huge, shining city. Mm. I remember I, w I was working as a journalist at the time. I was writing for um, a newspaper, a very short-lived newspaper called Today. Which was soon yesterday, really, wasn't Which it? Was, yes. was yesterday <laughs> incredibly quickly. Yeah. And I went to them, and I think, I think it was them that I went to and said, you know, I, I really want to do this. We've got um, Mouse, Dark Knight, and Watchmen all happening. I want to do a big piece on this thing. And they said, we can't. And I said, why not? And they said, well, it was Desperate Dan's 50th birthday this year, and we've already done our yeah. comics piece. Yeah, we've done comics. We've, we've done, done comics. Like, oh. We've written about Desperate Dan. And I'm yeah, going, yeah, no, yeah. but there is this well, giant. And, and then I went. We're talking about the battle being won. We're, well, still, we're still battling that, that same battle because it is the preset that you have to have the Beano. We have to go through the Beano to get beyond the Beano. I mean, I think but even, with, yeah, even yeah. with this show, I yeah. think what was quite interesting was obviously one of the challenges of it was to try and decide how to narrow down all of this incredible creativity. And I think the first thing we did was decide to focus on British creators. But then, you know, that had to go down again. And we thought sort of rebellion and, you know, and sedition. Um, which immediately sort of cut a lot of that children's material out. And I think it's been really interesting when we've spoken to people about the exhibition, it's the first thing they say. So it's a kids, it's nostalgia. Yeah. Um, but of course, it's not that anymore. And it hasn't been that for decades, really. But yeah. there is a sort of default. Well, still. Bit, what, what, I thought my, my taxi driver was saying mm -hmm. to me, oh, yeah, I used to read the Beano. I mean, if you said that, I, I once read Enid Blyton, I haven't read a single book since, or I once watched a Disney film, I don't know, Snow White or something, yeah. I haven't watched a single film since, you'd be, look, you'd be looked at as a laughing stock, wouldn't you? But people can say, I used to be the being the being, and that's the end of the conversation, you know. Which is incredible, because you, yeah. you've missed <laughs> out on so much. It's such a rich, I never understood that. Oh, I mean, I've, 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 had, I've always been fascinated by those conversations. Um, and, you know, being on American public radio in about 1990, promoting good omens and, somebody, mm -hmm. and you know, having somebody say, well, so Neil, you're also a, uh, you, you write comic books. And I said, yes. So what do you think of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles thing? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't actually write those kind of comic books. I, I, Slash, I write, I write comics yeah. for adults. And they're going, oh, oh, OK. And <laughs> they even know it's not that either. Okay. It's, it's, As in, but OK. <laughs> for me, I, I suppose for me, the, the, the key yardstick from where we were and from where we are now is, is back then when I was a journalist, um, I talked the Sunday Times magazine into letting me do a giant feature on comics. Mm. And they were the, the, their editor said yes. And I went round and I got original 
Brian Bollandart. There was some great, uh, they were, he was just working on Killing Joke. And um, Frank Miller was had almost finished Dark Knight, I think. And we got mm -hmm. some unpublished Dark Knight stuff. And I did interviews with Alan, with Frank, with Dave Gibbons, Dave Sim, the Hernandez brothers. And I handed this piece in and I was so proud of it and heard nothing. Mm. And finally, I let a week go by, and then I thought, this is very peculiar, and I phoned the Sunday Times, and, and I said, hello, this is Neil Gaiman. I, I sent in that article, and I said, ah, right, yes. Um, I'm afraid I, I, I read what you sent in, and I, I'm afraid I, I do have a bit of a problem with it. I said, okay, well, well what's the problem? And he said, well, I, I, I just don't think it really, I think it lacks balance. <laughs> and I said, OK, well, whatever it is, I'm sure I can put it in. He said, well, I'm not sure you can. You see, these comics, you seem to think they're a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we immediately realized that the, the balance he needed yeah. could not be added by me. And, <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. and they paid me actually the largest kill fee I'd ever received for that article. And I would still, I would rather have had the article published and received nothing. Interesting um, you mentioned the Sunday Times, because I, I will be provocative and say that you, we should all look at this Sunday, Sunday Times, because uh, our good friend Valdemar Janicek, you know, does fantastic documentaries about the arts, etc., has written a review of, our, of the exhibition Comics Unmasked over two pages, which is great. But there might be in need of, in need of balance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so get tweeting, yeah. everybody. Have a look at it. I mean, we, we don't know what it's going to say quite yet, but we gather it's going to need some... It'll, it may cause... Actually, we want to cause a bit of a stir with this yeah. show. We don't want just to be... We all love right. comics, and it's all we've won the battle, because we really well, haven't. We really Tori, haven't. Tori and I got, got a crash course walking through the show yeah. backwards just oh, now. Yes, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Which was, was a complete delight, um, mm -hmm. seeing the stuff there and seeing how well comics in England fit into both the literary and the artistic English mm -hmm. traditions. Yeah, I, I mean, do. you know, they, I, I get very puzzled when people say, well, of course, you know, books for adults never have illustrations. And you go, well, Dickens always did. Exactly. exactly. Um, it yeah. was intrinsic. In fact, it was one mm. of the things that set the tone with yeah, Dickens. Yeah. You, you knew if you were in a comedic or in a serious, and, and Dickens mm. began his career commissioned why, to, so why do you think we have this huge sort of schism with, with, within to say that pictures and words really don't shouldn't be mixing and shouldn't be do you cavorting, do you cavorting with each other? Cavorting with each other. <laughs> and do you think that's collapsing slightly with mm. with a modern culture which is much more visually led, and it becomes more? I, I don't know. I, I almost feel like comics should be coming more and more into their own now, and and mm. I think they are in a way. You know that kids are reading them on tablets and phones, and they just I just don't think there's that same baseline of sort of judgment. You know, they're playing, gaming is in the same breath as filmmaking, is in the same breath as TV. Uh, I don't know that there's still those divisions. I think the divisions between media exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think the ideas of what constitute valid media and why mm. are slowly breaking down as you get a generation that is absolutely prepared to say, but that's bullshit. Mm. Mm. And... Um, you know, I remember being, I think I was about 11 years old, and I, it was the first time I actually had the nerve to challenge a teacher. Mm. And I took my English teacher aside, and I said, look, OK, you have to explain this thing to me. Um, why a comics band? If we bring comics in, they will get, um, they'll get confiscated. I would love to lend some of my friends my comics, and talk comics, but we can't. And he said, well, it's obvious, Gaiman. Uh, you see, the thing is, if you, if it was Gaiman, uh, it, it's <laughs> obvious because it's, it's like, um, it's, it's rubbish. If, uh, you know, if you read comics, you won't read real literature. And I said, I am, hang on, I'm the only kid in this school who has read the school library. <laughs> so, I've read yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love comics, and that's obviously not true and expecting him to say, ah, but you don't understand, and, and to paint a, suddenly to make me understand. And he harumphed and walked away, and I realized that it didn't explain. There was, it was one of those things where 
But that's um, a really key moment for you. And it's, and it's funny because when we're talking to Dave Gibbons, who mm. obviously drew Watchmen for Alan Moore and was his collaborator, he said that his big light bulb moment was when mm. he went to school and the kids' comic books were confiscated and burned in the schoolyard. And when he saw that happening, he thought, this is a massively important medium, and how do I sign up? If you don't like comics, I do. Yeah. Basically, he decided yeah. that was his, yeah. of his so career. Yeah. That, yeah. that was have, definitely yeah. for me at mm. that point. It was, it, was, it was also the first point that I realized that the adult world was wrong. Mm. Up until that point, you know, adults would do mm. things, and you kind of take it on trust. And mm. you go, mm -hmm. well, it's your job to tell me true things, so I'm assuming that what you're telling me is probably true or true-ish. And it was the first time that I, I actually got to measure up what I was being told against my experience and what I knew and go, this and is not lot, true. And a lot of your work, I think, re references literature and you interchange very, very easily. I mean, mm. you, you're, you're, I think your comics, I don't know whether you're doing it consciously, but you, you have a very literary bent in your, in your comic book output as well. Was that something that was conscious that you felt you wanted to fight that corner? Because I, I have to say, funny enough, with this show, the reason I initially approached the British Library and basically that we decided to do this was because it felt like of all the uh, cultural institutes, this would be the best one because it would unpack that side of storytelling because mm. it's one of those funny things that people don't necessarily understand the, the, the process of making comic books. And having written comic books myself, when you say that to somebody, they always say, does that mean that you, you sort of, somebody hands you a page and then you write some words, you know, you I mean, fill out, fill in the balloons or something. no, actually it yeah, does yeah. have to be written first and that, yeah. you know, so Jesus, but, uh, you know, so, so it was, <laughs> no, so I mean, that was quite a conscious decision. Was that something that you felt that you wanted to address with your work or was that just a natural process of your creative? I think, I don't ever remember going, I think I'm going to be literary. Um, <laughs> I, I remember an awful lot of, I think I'll write the next panel and yeah. I want this to be interesting. Yeah. I but I, but I also that, thought... Sorry, it was important that when, you do, that when you do Violent Cases of Dave McKean, the key thing was that on the back of it, it didn't say superheroes or whatever, or comics, it had said general fiction. Do you yes, remember that? I remember, I remember that you, you and Dave were so us. happy about that, because that was the point. There's all these other kinds of storytelling that don't sit in these, yeah. trapped in these little genre formulas. Yeah. <laughs> it was, what was, what, was what was important for us mm. with Violent Cases was having a comic that we could show people, mm. where, because what was frustrating for me is that I would show people Mouse or Dark Knight or Watchmen and they'd say, well, it's superheroes or it's Batman or it's, it's mice and cats. I mean, it's funny animals. And yeah. they're going, well, OK, then um, let's make a comic that, it, it, you know, has to the best of my, whatever I was, 26-year-old ability, mm -hmm has all of the values of mainstream fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let, it will get drawn by Dave with all the power of 23-year-old Dave McKean just finishing art college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we will take it out to the world. And, and Dave's, Dave's dedication was something like, you know, to my teacher, Roly, look, this is what we meant by comics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he'd been having that argument too. He'd mm -hmm. show people comics mm -hmm. and they couldn't see what we saw. We saw yeah. the potential and mm. we were perfectly willing. You know, I remember with Watchmen, um, Alan Moore showing me the black and whites of Watchmen and not knowing what this was, but just reading it and going, okay, everything's changed. Mm. Yeah. This is, this is, was, yeah. there was a line in the sand before Absolutely. this There's comic and now I'm reading this. Watchmen, but it was absolutely. such a special moment though that all of you were working in, mm. in, in that time. What do you think created that? I mean, Looking at this show, one of the things that I'd suggest maybe is that for the first time there were quite a lot of um, regular weekly comics that were starting to support more interesting material, but there was still this massive leap that you all made. What do you think? I think the, the, the biggest thing um, was you had a bunch of particularly writers yeah. who had grown up loving comics as kids and teenagers outgrowing comics in the sense that there wasn't anything around for us by the time we were 16 or 17, mm -hmm. but believing that there should be, and then going off and reading everything else, mm. and coming back to comics in our 20s, having read all the novels, having, you know, what, what I thought was most interesting is when you get me 
and Grant Morrison together, or me and Alan Moore, or me and, me and um, Jamie Delano, or, or any of the right Pete Millian, we weren't talking superhero comics. We probably weren't talking comics very much, mm -hmm. apart mm -hmm. from the fact that we would occasionally talk you know, travails with artists. Um, but mostly, what we would be talking was interesting poets we discovered, interesting writers. Mm -hmm. um, I remember giving uh, Ian Sinclair mm -hmm. to Alan Moore and saying, I think you should read, read his stuff. Mm -hmm. I think this is interesting. Yeah. Um, that Grant Morrison gave me uh, Lucy, oh my god, what's her name? Um, the New Mother. Anybody out here know who wrote Say it loudly if you know. I've just, I've I just blanked. Um, a friend of, friend of, um, friend of Henry James's, wrote, Lucy Clifford, mm -hmm. um, wrote the strangest, most peculiar, um, rule-breaking, odd, disturbing Victorian children's fiction, mm. and one of her stories was a story called *The New Mother*. And Grant Morrison had discovered this book called Anyhow Stories. Mm. And, uh, and I just remember him sort of telling me the plot of the new mother about how these two children named Blue Eyes and Turkey run into this wild child in the village who has an instrument called a pear drum, a musical instrument. And she explains to them that if they look inside, they'll see little people dancing. And when she plays the instrument, and they say, well, will you do it for us? And she says, I'll do it, but you have to go home and be naughty first. <laughs> so they go home, and, and they're naughty. But then their mother says to them, you can't do this. You can't be wild children. You have to be normal children. If you're wild, then I will have to go away. And your new mother will come with her glass eyes and her wooden tail. Mm -hmm. But the children do not listen, and they, and they go back. And the wild child in the village square says, no, no, you must. You have to be more naughty, and finally you'll get to see it. They go back, and they're naughty, and this happens a couple of times, and finally they go home, and their mother's packing. <laughs> and she says, I'm sorry, I have to go now. And she leaves. And then they hear, coming down the road from far away, the swish, swish of the wooden tail of their new mother as she approaches, and they see the, uh, the setting sun glinting on her glass eyes, and they run off into the forest where they live, and the new mother moves into their house, and sometimes they peek through the door. Um, wow. And, um, you know, if, if anything inspired Coraline. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was, it was just the realization that, okay, you know, Victorian writers for children could do that shit. I've got a yeah. I could do that shit. Um, but well, I was showing you that, 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 was that, the that stuff. wonderful comic that we got, the, the Dolly's Revenge comic we got in, in the yes. exhibition, which is just like a nightmare where this girl has been maltreating her dolls and, one, and they come to life and do the same thing to her and hammer nails into her head and cut her hair up and fantastic stuff. It's all that kind of straw, Peter, <laughs> cautionary tale. It's meant to make kids stuff behave. It has, a, has a kind yeah. of, in theory, a message of being, actually, you should behave. It's not, is it subversive, that story? Or is it actually I, saying I, I think, you I should think... behave, otherwise you'll end up with this terrible... Situation. I think Maybe. it has this glorious surface yeah. of, of we are telling you a cautionary tale for your exactly. own good, behave exactly. or your parents will go away. Yes. But actually what it says is the world is fucked up and weird <laughs> and cannot be understood or comprehended yeah. and there are pair drums that may or may not exist and other mothers and new mothers yeah. and um, your mother may leave. Yes, <laughs> may abandon you. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and which I think is a much more interesting sort of yeah. version of reality. Oh, yeah, it's got levels I that. think we might want to invite our other uh, guest up at this point. Do you want this sitting here, do you think? Yeah, yeah? Okay. yeah, I think so. Why don't you put Tori next to me and move I up there? I so you, I you want flank it. us. I've worn the seat up for you. That one, that's, um, that, okay. yeah. so. Could we please welcome Tori Amos? Tori Amos. <laughs> Two of you. I mean, this is yeah. a clumsy question, but you do, do you not normally appear on stage together? We do not normally appear on stage <laughs> really? together. Yes. It's a naive question. You know about that already. Um, no, I mean, I mean we. It's the kind of thing where um, have we ever done 
I don't think so, don't Johnny. Think well, well, can I can mm. I just say that mm. when we set the show up uh, and we first got the gig two years ago. This was one of the very first things that I was determined to do was put you guys Absolutely. together. Thanks. So we are really, this really like pleased that both of you in your kind of mad lives have managed to yeah, actually make the, the time to join us. Yeah. We took so our So it's good selfie. magic. We had our first selfie we did. together. Oh my God, this is serious. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 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 the crazy bit is we have been friends now for 23 years. And as far as I know, there's one photo of us together. <laughs> okay, this which get, which, gets, which yeah. gets rolled out every time that you know, somebody needs something. This one photo of us taken in Minneapolis in 1996 gets, <laughs> gets rolled out. So finally, so there are more photos. Can we find out how you guys met? What happened? Um, it was Rance Hensley's fault. It was? Um, yeah, it was. I, I, well, from my, I can tell you from my, my story, which is um, I was at the 1991 San Diego Comic Convention, and I was doing a signing. And back then, I would have, oh, 11 or possibly 12 people in my signing line. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a very nice guy called Rance Hosley. I was in the line. And when he got to the front, I signed his whatever it was. And he said, um, I've got something for you. And he gave me a tape, and a cassette tape. And he said, this is from um, my friend Tori. She's a singer-songwriter, and she sings about you on one of the songs, Please Don't Sue Her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I took it home with me. I didn't play it or anything at the, the, <coughs> at the thing. Um, took it home. And it wasn't even the first one of the cassettes that I'd been given that I played. I remember the first one that I played was sort of Scandinavian harmonium death metal. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, Lord Morpheus, come down from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Was Sandman music? Was it actually Sandman well, music? There was. People used to give me, especially at, at San Diego Comic Con, they yeah. would give me cassettes. Their interpretations of Sandman. And, 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 yeah, yeah. it, it, and it was mostly really so bad. This is a double edged compliment. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you were up against. Like. And then, and then so you thought Torres might have been something like that? I, yeah. I had no idea. No, no. I'd never been given anything that was good. <laughs> <laughs> And I put Tories in. There's an archive of these. Is there somewhere? We should, we should really do they're, 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 they Actually, many of them magically became <laughs> blank cassettes. Um, <laughs> and were reused for other more. We re um, but, reused them, yes. But Tories, it wasn't Little Earthquakes. It was about half of the songs on Little Earthquakes and half of the things that wound up being B-sides in the Little Earthquakes days. But I put it on, and one song in, I, I was completely blown away. I did that thing where you keep driving mm -hmm. because you don't want the music to end. And, um, and, there, was a, uh, and there was an address in, in the thing. And it was a London address, which I thought was a bit weird because yeah. I thought she was American. Um, and I sent some comics and a note off just saying, I think you're wonderful. And then a few days later, I'd open it up on, Actually, I think I wanted to find out what the songs were called, because there was no information about song titles and to see if there was more information. And I realized there was a phone number. So I dialed the phone number, and Tori answered. And I said, I'm just listening to your music, and, and you're wonderful. And who are you? And tell me about this. <laughs> so, and, and she did sing about me. There was this line about me and Neil hanging out with the Dream King, which I love the fact that we were hanging out before we'd ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Meant to be. We were hanging out yeah. because Rance um, was a, how do we talk about Rance? He's wonderful. He was an art student and he uh, needed a place to stay. He had dated a gal that I used to babysit. This is how crazy connections are. And they had fallen out. But he and I stayed friends. He was like a little brother. I'm Neil's big sister. And Rance was like a little brother. And um, what happened was I let him stay at the flat in, uh, it was behind a church in Hollywood, and I would stay with my boyfriend so that he had a place to stay. And he was obsessed with metal music and comics. And there were comics all over. I would come into this place, and there was comics everywhere, the wooden tops, all kinds of music playing. And I thought, oh my goodness. He's taken over the flat. I don't know what's happening here. And I would just start, as, as an older sister does, you just start perusing. <laughs> so what is he into? Mm, what's he like? Yeah. And so I started reading. What was I reading? The Doll's House? No. Um, yeah, it would have been Doll's House back then. Yeah. And, um, and I think it was Calliope. May have been Calliope yes, was Calliope the one was the that, he, one, he, that yes. I think was the first one he gave you. 
Did you immediately feel that rapport with his work? Because, um, you know, we're showing a couple of slides which are completely random, but one of the things that... <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that interests... Well, this is actually... OK, well, OK, hear me out, hear me out. This is a good one to start on, because that oh, yeah. is mythology, which is something they have a lot in common with. And actually, strangely enough, that is the Egyptian goddess uh, Sekhmet, who you have, you have felt quite close to and you've referred to. Mm -hmm. And you are really interested in the Egyptian goddess Bastet, who true. is and, in... And Sekhmet turns Game up comes... in, in Ocean at the End of the Lane as well. Of course, uh -huh. yeah. And so th there are these parallels in your, in your work. Um, did you immediately feel that rapport with what, he was, with what he was doing in his comics? Well, because he had mythology through mm. with... Um, Again, it's the only comic book I'd ever read. So the <laughs> first one I one. read <laughs> well, just included a world that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. What, so what I thought was thing. interesting about that, though, was lots of people discovered Sandman back then. Um, and it almost didn't occur to them that anybody was making this thing. It was just a comic. <laughs> and and what I loved it. was you were me and Neil hanging out with the Dream King. It was like going, OK, there's somebody writing this, and this is... This, and Neil says hi, by the way. And we didn't even know each other. Mm -hmm. And now I get to write Neil says hi, by the way, on Tory fans' <laughs> things. And, and they say, oh, you must have been such good friends. It's like, no, that came later. <laughs> but having said that, it was absolutely immediate. I mean, I remember we, we um, talking on the phone. We would talk for hours. Mm. And then I went up to see you play at the Canal Brasserie. Oh, my god. Do you remember that? I do. It was somebody's birthday. It was the owner's birthday, and, and you had to play happy birthday to you in the middle of your game. <laughs> and, but in the middle oh. of Crucify, and they were <laughs> looking. What? Do you remember that? Yeah. I do. And you came, and they brought the Melody Maker, somebody. There was it a was, journalist. The gig there, existed. I, I, if, if, if I remember correctly, you explained it to me, because the gig only existed because Melody Maker had to see you do something to write about it. So your publicist had arranged this thing where the only two people in that space to see you were me and the guy from Melody That's Maker. Right. You'd invited me, and, and she was sitting with the guy from Melody Maker. Um, and I came in, and you waved at me, which I thought was quite impressive, because you didn't know what I looked like. Um, <laughs> but I figured I must have looked like me by that point. <laughs> and then we went off, and you acted out the Silent All These Years video. Did I? On, yes. <laughs> you were going to be shooting it the next morning, and so you acted out the entire thing on the tube station platform <laughs> for me. And you're going, and then I'm this little girl, and I'm in a box, and the box is going to go around the world. <laughs> uh, Do you know, Tash is cringing right now because she is told you cannot act out things at the train station. <laughs> so we don't. Well, that's not. Nice. It's gone. Yeah. Tash, who do you think you get it from? <laughs> No, you were, you, were, you, were, you were doing the full thing. And, um, and I think we were, you know, we were definitely friends from that moment. And I introduced you to Dave McKean, That's right. who did a, a, that wonderful, wonderful little cover. cover. But, but what was happening is we would exchange. We were, would just start talking and then busking mm -hmm. and then sharing stories. So Neil is a great talker. He's a good listener, too, a wonderful listener. But he would talk about... Um, mythology and that was that was really exciting because we would I don't even know what we talk about half the time but it would last for hours and hours and hours it would last for hours and hours and we would and we would build things yeah, build I mean a lot of, a lot of Sandman um, and Sandman in weird ways came out of being friends with you the the more or less the I don't even think I've ever told you this pretty much the entire second half structure of Sandman um, was figured out during your gig. It was down in Houston somewhere, and it was your first proper big gig. Um, Shaw, was it Shaw Theater? Oh, the Shaw Theater, yeah. Yeah, the Shaw Theater. Oh. And... <laughs> <laughs> did I play the Shaw Theater? <laughs> you did. It was, your, it was your first big London gig. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just remember sitting there while you were playing and just going, oh, I know how this works. And it was a sudden figuring out that, okay, I'm going to have Lucifer playing piano in his nightclub, and I'm going to have 
and this will happen. And it was like I had all the pieces in place, and I had the, the overall shape of Sandman, but by the end of, of that gig, I knew exactly how The Kindly Ones was going to work. That's funny you say that, because that's how mediums cross, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So there are times I'll be reading something mm -hmm. of his, even now, I mean all the time, but back then as well, where I'll be reading something that, some story, and um, all of a sudden you start hearing combinations of melodic combinations or rhythms, and it might only be a word or a phrase at a time. Mm -hmm. And you're, of course I'm looking at the pictures, but I'm hearing the st it's the story. Mm -hmm. And then the muses come and visit you, because see, it's strange how, I mean, we've, all, we've talked about this a long time, we both believe in the muses, and we, we express it in different ways. <laughs> but Calliope was a great story about the muses mm -hmm. and the idea mm -hmm. that if mm -hmm. you don't acknowledge the muses and honor the muses, then they stop coming to you. Mm -hmm. And yet how they come sometimes is very much, you go to other mediums, so it makes sense that I don't always go to music to get music. Mm -hmm. You go to different places. I go to dance quite a bit. The painters, mm -hmm. a lot of um, the artists. But it's the storytellers. <laughs> And mythology is a big place where story would come through. You never want to get your inspiration from people doing the thing that you're doing. Mm. That's not where you yeah. get your inspiration. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like the thing that I was talking about, the fact that with the other comics writers, we didn't talk comics. Mm. Mm. We talked everything else. Mm. Um, Otherwise, it becomes a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, as you've said. It exactly. just feeds on itself. It feeds yes, on itself. Yes, and yes. But they can inspire you. Absolutely. They can push you. Yeah. And you can look yeah. at something and go, oh, I didn't realize you could do that. I can do, if you can do that, then I'm going to do something even cooler. Yeah. Or, yeah. or die trying. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Which is really fun. But, uh, you know, the things, if, if I wanted to point at things that inspired Sandman, um, things like Sandman number six, um, the Dinah story, 24 hours, came out of going and seeing the Peter Greenaway film, Drowning by Numbers, mm -hmm. which has gone on to become one of my favorite films and, and was pretty much one of my favorite films from then. But just going, oh, I didn't realize you could structure something like this. He just structures it, counting one to 100, and when he <coughs> reaches 100, you're done. And then I thought, well, I wonder if you can count your way through a comic. I've got 24 pages, what could I do in 24 pages? Well, I could do 24 hours. I could do one hour per page. And then that entire conceit fell apart because I thought, well, I can't actually. I need like five or six pages just to set up everything in the first hour, so I'm going to have to go half pages later on. Mm. But it was that idea of going beat for beat for beat through 24 hours inexorably because I had 24 pages mm. that, that took me into it. And, um, and it's not something that I would ever have got from a comic. It was something that you get yeah. from yeah. going outside. Mm -hmm. And Tari and I, I think, have, have, we do inspire each other. I come away from conversations with her inspired. I come away from her music inspired. Um, There's also something that I think the two of you share, which is you're both really quite fierce. And in terms of the <laughs> work that you, that, you know, that we're showing some of, like Sandman, I mean, it was deeply controversial when you think that someone like Kevin O'Neill was banned by the Comics Code Authority for crucifying an alien. Like, who cares? And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, actually, and then, actually, and for, then, for, and then... In, in Kevin's defense, the Comics Code Authority did say that he was the only artist whose yeah. style was unacceptable Whatever. to the comics. <laughs> what, it didn't Whatever matter. He could have drawn anything, and he wouldn't have been allowed yeah, to attack, which I love. What a compliment. So it's fantastic. He was so proud of that, as he should be. Um, you know, and, and you know, the, the controversial images that you had in your album, Line in I mean, you were being, you know, you were really pushing the envelope as well. And yeah. that's something I really admired about you guys and, and continue to admire about you. And it's something we're trying to really highlight in the show is that. And it slightly yeah. concerns me yeah. that I don't see an awful lot of that really kind of pushing or attempting to change structure as much. And that's something that worries me, particularly mm. in terms of spirituality or even a discussion of spirituality it doesn't seem to... Well, that's funny you say mm. that, not yeah. to interrupt you too, no, brother. No, but the thing is, um, somebody was asking me before about the sexuality in the music industry. And hey, whatever gets you off, do you think? That's the way I see it. But, the, but you brought something that's very important to the table, which mm. is not all of it. Sometimes it's, it's not, sub many times it's not subversive. Mm. It's not as if the envelope, you do some, 
You know, you say, okay, okay, put your clothes mm. on, love. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. that's, you're not saying anything. Mm. Now, I encourage everybody to express themselves the way they want to, but you're a bunch of artists sitting here. So what I think is important is you're talking about pushing the envelope. Now, that is about intention, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because somebody, um, we were walking through the sex tent downstairs. <laughs> now, what's interesting about this, though, mm -hmm. As we were looking at it, weren't we? We were looking at things from the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about a material that had to go to France and to get back in here. And when you think about um, some of the work that's downstairs and the intention behind it, mm -hmm. and um, what it was causing people to do, and the art behind it, that's what's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. You're talking mm -hmm. about pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we've been committed to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's, that is about spirituality mm -hmm. because it is talking about the heart. The mm -hmm. heart's the most dangerous place. Mm -hmm. and we've talked about this for years and years and years, that once you take your clothes off, th that's the beginning. Now let's take the skin off. Mm -hmm. Now let's go underneath. Let's go into the cell structure, into the DNA. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the thoughts that are there inside your mm -hmm. being that you don't even know are there because you don't allow them to speak. So this is, we'll talk about allowing our other selves, the other Neil, the other Tori, mm -hmm. to tell us the story they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the most dangerous things we talk about are not the shocking things mm -hmm. or the subversive things, mm -hmm. but it's about the stuff that's um, where we feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was, it's been so strange for me coming in from the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan, um, just in right, Jordan. Um, yeah. because I, yeah. I've never, um, I've never felt so vulnerable as by the end of it. Right. There was there was a point um, where I went through these three days talking to refugees, realizing that for, uh, the the thing about Syrian refugees is they love Syria. They want to go back. Mm. This is their favorite place in the world. They think Syria is the best place. Um, it's an awful lot nicer. Homeland. It's yeah, an awful what, lot yeah, nicer what were, than. What were you doing now? I was there for the United Nations Refugee Agency (UNHCR), and uh, mostly because they discovered that when I, when I tweet, um, and just amplified their message, they were getting more people coming in than from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So they came to me and said, "Would you like to be an ambassador? Would you like to go out and, you know, just just be a supporter, and we will we will show you what it's like on the ground?" And I said, mm -hmm. "Yes, absolutely." Um, Tell but them I was what you saw. Tell them you were telling me this story, and I think they'll find it fascinating. You met somebody who works one way by day, and then is a volunteer. And tell them you were there with the oh, bandages. Oh, it was. Uh, um, well, what was amazing for me, over and over, over those three days, and I will, I will get yeah. there. But yes, o over those three days, what I kept experiencing was, on the one hand deep despair at what human beings could do mm. to other human beings, at the fragility of civilization, at the monstrous acts that people were capable of doing. Um, the awfulness, after a while, just of the fact that when people would tell me about how their houses were blown up, uh, one guy, his house was blown up. He wanted to run, to, he was on his motorbike. He saw the house blow up. He drove back. Um, to try and get his kids out of the rubble and was shot in the back by a trainee sniper who was just practicing on shooting things. And other people had stories that were much, much worse. And whenever I would talk to these people about what, well, I'd say, well, who did this? Who blew up your house? Who, who shot you? Who cut off your cousin's head? Who did whatever the thing was? Um, they'd say, we don't know. I began, well, was this, was this Assad? Was this the rebels? Was this Ward's group? They're like, we don't know. Mm. And you start to realize that, <coughs> that there is this monstrousness. But in there with this monstrousness, over and over again, I was, I was elated and buoyed and held up and held together and got through it by watching people doing wonderful things. The fact that they've thrown together a city of 100,000 refugees, this camp, it's 100,000 people. And they've just built another one 
that will take 130,000 in the desert. And, they, you know, it's, and they're out there and they're doing it. This guy, Ayman, who, um, lovely, <laughs> lovely man who, who showed me pictures of his house in Syria that no longer exists because it was bombed and um, works all day for one of the, uh, as, as a sort of community mobilizer, comes home at the end of a long day's work and um, goes out on his rounds as a volunteer nurse, visiting people who need medical attention but can't get out, the old people, shut-ins. Um, and I went with him on, on his rounds. And I watched, you know, as he, a, a good-looking 22-year-old young man who on his walk home trod on a landmine and has no foot left. Mm. And for the last four months, every two days, ayman has been changing his dressings. And uh, then went to the tent um, where an 11-year-old girl, this beautiful 11-year-old girl who had, her mother was there, her uncle, her five sisters. Um, her father wasn't there because her father was killed in the same mortar attack that destroyed half her jaw and took out the bones in her upper arm. And Ayman was there unpeeling, taking off the dressing and putting the cream on and dressing this mess that was this child's, once this child's jaw. Mm. And I look around and there's my, and I've been asking these guys, how, how do you cope? The, the, the UNHCR people, how do, you, how do you see? Every single person has a story of hell. None of them wanted to leave. It got bad enough that they had to leave. The journey to Jordan was dangerous, nightmarish. People talked about passing chopped up body parts. Of, of, you know, there's people, they've been shooting at women and children crossing the border. It, it's, it's all monstrous. Um, I would be fascinated, though, to see not only how this is going to affect your writing, because it will, but you telling this story to these creators here, how that will affect your process because you're going to be open to some of you already are. I wasn't open to this mm. story because mm. I didn't know it and I haven't mm. exposed myself. Mm. But it will affect mm. how mm. I then investigate the story. It's going to have a big, big wider impact, isn't mm. it, in effect, yeah. It, it's, and, uh, you know, I felt like I was doing some good because I tweeted yesterday morning. I can't believe it was only yesterday morning. Um, you know, just did a short tweet about the shape. I was in listening to some of these stories. An hour later, the BBC World Service are on the phone asking if they can interview me, and they do an interview, and it goes out, and it's heard by 70 million people. And I'm talking to them about the people that I followed through the registration process the day before who were, were stunned, had not slept, um, had not eaten real food in in a long time, they'd got to the point where they were eating cats and dogs and making soup from grass and tree leaves and things just to try and feed their children. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, the nightmare that they went through getting... So to be able to communicate that is very powerful. So it, but, but and, that... And get, tell that story. But, but I think as Tori said, but, that uh, the ability to really, you will tell that story in but an extraordinary still, fashion, but you will have to process that, and I'm, it will take time. It's still it very, also, very raw. Yeah, but I'm really also proud of, you know, you were asking where the cutting edge is these days. There, I don't think there was ever a point for me, and I'm pretty sure there was never a point for Tori, even at our weirdest, even at our most outre, and even at the points where we suddenly found ourselves in the press, mm. um, where it ever occurred to us that we were pushing the envelope mm. or trying to be weird. What we were doing was going, well, I've got stuff to say. Mm. Mm. And so you'd say it. You'd say the stuff you had to say. And most of the time... It comes back to what Tori was saying as well, which is sometimes what that's doing is opening you up and allowing you to be vulnerable because you are aware mm. that if you say mm. something, actually there will be a response and people yeah. will come for you, so you better be absolutely sure of your intention. So I yes. think that's what you're saying is if you, s if you do something brave and you have the intention that's pure, you yes. can stand behind it, whatever comes mm -hmm. down on you. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're just doing it for no reason, for you're going to get just taken down. For publication or something. Yeah. Just yeah. before yeah. I met Tori, um, I went through a, a 
long, dark weekend of the soul. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a night. It, 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 went, it was Friday oh, through to Monday. Because um, I got a phone call on the Friday from my editor, Karen Berger, letting me know that the, a Philadelphia newspaper had been in touch um, because a guy had, who was a Sandman fan had committed suicide. And um, he'd left a suicide note, signed the Sandman, and there was a copy of um, Sandman on his body. And I had to go, OK, did I, did I do that? Mm -hmm. did, I, did I do something that could have tipped somebody over? What did I do? What, what was I doing? How did that happen? And, and I remember phoning Clive Barker, phoning Alan Moore, phoning anybody that I could think of who might have had similar things, and then talking through their, their stories and actually going, OK, I think I'm a responsible creator. I, mm. I haven't told any stories I cannot stand behind. Mm. Anybody who would have killed themselves after reading Sandman would have killed themselves after seeing the Bible or The Sound of Music. Mm. Or it, it's not, particularly I the haven't, sound of music. particularly The Sound of Music. <laughs> um, <laughs> on, it, it only lasted yeah. till Monday because on Monday I discovered that actually what had happened was this guy, this guy's boyfriend had murdered him uh -huh. and, um, and had decided to make it look like uh -huh. a, an occult inspired comic killing and had written the suicide note and actually, neither he nor the boyfriend had read Sandman. They were big X-Men fans. Um, See, that was the real problem. Yeah, but see, the thing you were saying before, Chris Claremont. The, yeah. the, the occult does get blamed yeah. for all kinds of things. And mm -hmm. those of us who are interested in different, um, well, subjects, I don't even know if you'd call it, um, uh, spiritualities but mm -hmm. but sometimes things get boxed in don't they mm -hmm. are you this or are you that mm -hmm. and we've talked about this for years too that people's belief systems can be very complex mm -hmm. and evolving mm -hmm. and that it's okay for it to be evolving you mm -hmm. don't have to say I'm a Wiccan or mm -hmm. I'm a this mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the, a unicorn mm -hmm. the, <laughs> <laughs> the glorious thing for me about Sandman was that you had this magnificent anarchy of belief in which everything was true. Mm, mm. And, um, and that was wonderful. That was, that was intensely liberating. And the death was hot. Oh, yes. <laughs> she was definitely amazing. And we all yeah. wanted to be deaf, but yeah. we all didn't get to be deaf, did yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> But it's also, I mean, it Sam is very, very open to interpretation. It, it wasn't sort of being in any way kind of prescriptive or mm. specific or here's a message or here's a particular mm. mythology or a right or right wrong. wrong. Yeah, it was, it was storytelling, it was celebrating storytelling, celebrating possibility. Did it drive you to explore things as much as you were exploring things and then writing from that? Or did you feel that it was pushing you to look at certain things? It, it drove me to, I, I mean, for me, Sam Man existed in this weird balancing act between everything that I had read between, you know, the point that I started to read and the point that I was writing whatever episode I was on and the need to find stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, I remember my, my horror at realizing that I was going to have to write a French Revolution story <laughs> and that I had three weeks how were you, to research how were you the French history, Revolution. Yeah. How, how were you at history at school? You, was that, what, was your, what was your weakest was, subject at school? Uh, weakest history subject History was one of my weakest subjects. Oh, I, I had a terrible teacher. All, it was all just dates and acts of I was going to say, I was... I was Nothing human I at all. Didn't, I didn't fall in love with history till I was writing but, Sandman. But how could you not love, fall in love with history? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's us. It was because yeah. all you had... It was dates of wars mm. Mm. Oh, and occasional corn famines and things. <laughs> and, <laughs> Or corn laws, which were even weirder than famines, because at least I could, I could. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't. Um, suddenly, you I had to gen up on the French Revolution, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's 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 been really interesting mm. how quickly I could research things um, mm. when I needed to, mm. and because you you'd go, okay, I need the nuggets, I need those things oh, that yeah. suddenly bring everything to life, and Until they'd always be there. Google. For, this is before Google. We yeah. had to go. You can just look it up. But that no. made, that made every, in, in weird ways, that would always make things easier. Because now, with Wikipedia and Google and things, there's always too much information. Mm. 
what was great was you'd have you'd have you you'd go out and you would find one book on the French Revolution and you'd read you know, I read Simon Sharma's French Revolution and that was that was my research um, for um, you know for for the Augustus episode of, of Sandman, it was um, Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, mm -hmm. uh, just the, the Julius Caesar and the Augustus chapters. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was the entirety mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of what can I build this with? I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of other stuff about Augustus, but I will use this because mm -hmm. the clock is ticking. <laughs> and um, the Are hardest- Are you still quite a voracious reader? I mean, this, this is obviously reading with a with viewpoint of, I've got to do this, is, this is where my story is going, I must research it, but uh, do, you, I'm, I'm, do you explore? I'm, re uh, I'm rediscovering my voracious readerness. Yeah. My voracious yeah. readerness went away for a little bit and I couldn't figure out why hmm. until I realized I needed reading glasses. Because <laughs> um, right. reading had stopped being fun hmm. and I couldn't figure out why, why is reading, which was always my salvation. So much fun, uh, and now it's not fun. And I've got books that aren't getting finished, aren't mm. getting read, and mm. finally went out and got those. Ah. <laughs> Do you know what's really important, though, I find is that I'm open to uh, people suggesting to me what to read. So you and I have had this chat today. Mm -hmm. um, you're always telling me what to do, which is great. I welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you'll receive your reading list. He's going to give me a <laughs> list, okay? Because I don't know about a lot that's going on downstairs. I just don't. So mm. I know the Sandman, and that's the end of it. But um, <laughs> but I want to know. Mm -hmm. And at 50, I can tell you, I'm at a state. Maybe when I was 28, and maybe you remember this, you wouldn't always cop to how stupid you felt because mm. because sometimes you just feel that people it's that one one up on you mm. or they make you feel mm. um that you are stupid or you make yourself feel stupid mm. you, but, make, you know what yeah. i mean you feel I, 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 with, with with my friend Roz caveney i would have conversations with Roz, and she would always talk about stuff that i didn't know as if i did and I would never come to it. I would simply run away and read the thing before the next time I saw Roz, which meant that my reading, very often in very interesting, I discovered these great things I would never have discovered. I'd just go, yes, Roz. And then run away and read it. So if any of you want to tell us something to read, we'll go read it. But, okay. but it's about balancing time. So as a creator, you're always cool. having to balance input and output, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to figure, guys, sometimes you've got to push yourself on pilgrimage. You've got to do it. Mm. So when you stay in your safe place all the time, you've got to break the routine sometimes in order for the diff different muses to come. Mm -hmm. And you don't always have to experience everything yourself. So you don't have to have seven divorces, OK? <laughs> you know, in order to mm. write this fantastical stuff. And I know you know that here. But sometimes it's really about allowing yourself to um, experience things, read things that maybe you weren't open to before. So I'm waiting for my list from you. Mm -hmm. You're going to bring me a list, and you're going to send right. me a list. I, yeah. I always love that line. <laughs> I always, yeah. always love that line about be, be dull and bourgeois in your life so you can be wild and unconstrained in your work. Ah. Um, yeah. Which, and what I've always loved about that is I've known people who were much wilder in their life than in their work, and I've known maybe people who were as wild in their life yeah. and their work, and then I've known people who were genuinely, you know, you would assume no, talking to them that they were, you know, retired bank managers from some small provincial bank in which nothing ever happened. And then you read their books and you go, you're... Wow. Mm, Where's yeah. that coming? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Should we open this up? I think yes, we'd love should. to do that. Yeah. You wanted to ask some questions, I'm sure you do. We've got a microphone running around, I right, think. Can have we, we each have our first one here? I've got quite a loud voice, so I'm happy to do the right <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Do it, girl. <laughs> Boom, go for it. Um, this is Mm -hmm. and by a woman. Can you tell us a little bit more about Tashi's Well, she's here. Well, the Blueberry Girl is here. Tashi's here. Where are you, Tashi? Hello. <laughs> that is the Blueberry Girl. So I was writing American Gods. 
the and beach house. Yeah. I, no, I wasn't at the beach house. I had checked into a hotel in Las Vegas. It was September 2001. Oh, my goodness. Um, He's got a good memory, hasn't he? Yes, no, he September 2000, sorry. Oh, yeah. Not 2001, yeah, September 2000. 2000. It was September 2000. <laughs> and um, I was in the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas where I'd gone because I discovered that you could check into hotels for incredibly cheap <laughs> um, and um, in Las Vegas at that yeah. time. But these days, they're sort of more... They, they, they're no longer just trying to get you to go and stay there cheap so you could gamble. Right. Um, and I was finishing American Gods, and I was just in mad finishing American Gods mode. And I got a phone call from Tori, who said, the date of Tash's birth has been decided. Um, please, will you write me a prayer? Will you write me a prayer for, and she'd been, and she'd been calling her the blueberry. Um, the bump became the blueberry. Um, and she said, well, will you write some kind of prayer for the blueberry? And I said, yes, of course. And I wrote that for her. And I phoned her back a day or so later. And I said, this is what I wrote. And, and I said, no, I will get it calligraphed. And it will be on the wall. Um, you, can, you can put it up she by the has cot. It. You have it in your room So from Uncle Neil. So that was. <laughs> That was where the poem began. I, I, it, was, it was simply written, it was never written for publication, it was written um, for as, Tash. As a prayer is interesting. And it, it yeah. was very much a prayer, because yeah. that was what well, Tori wanted. She was but, a footling breach, Tash, so um, I was high risk. I mm. had a couple miscarriages mm. already, so Neil mm. knew this. And it was with trepidation mm. that um, you know, she was late. Mm. And we knew she was a footling breach. And um, they said, we have, we know we got to take her. We got to bring her into the world. Mm -hmm. And he knew that. Mm -hmm. And so this was the prayer. So that was the prayer, that she turn up and that she get all that stuff. That and and it wasn't session. ever meant to be published. But what would happen is sometimes I would do it at readings. And before I did it at readings, I would always say, look, if anybody here is recording this, please turn off your recording device just for this bit, mm. because this isn't for the public. This was something that was just for Tori, but I'd love to read it, and I would. And then what would happen is um, afterwards, people would come up to me, and they'd say, could I have a copy of that? My friend is pregnant. My friend's just had a baby. And I would say, yes, and I would give them copies. And there was a point. Um, it wasn't, I think, until about 2003, 2004. Having, I, I, so I'd been saying no to people for 14 years that finally, um, I called Tori and said, I want to do it as a book. I want to give a bunch of the, the profits to Rain, which is now what happens every year. Um, and um, because I'm tired of printing this out and giving it to <laughs> <laughs> and, and Charles Vess. And, and it took Charles, I think, um, you know, several years to do the art. And then, and then the book became, in a very peculiar way, my salvation. Um, because I was on my way to the only signing of the book, which was in New York, Tales of Wonder, on uh, March the 7th, 2009. And I was, um, um, Charlie, Charles Vest was waiting for me at Tales of Wonder. I was a little bit early. Um, and I was in the cab, and I got the phone call saying, my father just died of an unexpected heart attack in the middle of a business meeting. And went for a walk around Union Square, phoned a few people. Um, that was the first time, the, the, the fact that the first person that I phoned was this, this girl named Amanda Palmer that I just started going out with actually told me an awful lot about what I thought of Amanda and the fact that she offered immediately and sincerely to cancel her Australian tour and fly back. Told me a lot about how she felt about me and, and I said no. Um, but then I went nice and read Blueberry Girl, still reeling to a thousand people, and signed from one o'clock in the afternoon till nine o'clock at night uh, for about a thousand, fourteen hundred people. And um, that was my salvation. That was I was I was completely shell shocked.
booked. And I got to hold on to that book, and I got to say thank you one person at a time to each of the people who came up. And, and most of them had children. Most of them, many of them had babies. They had stories about yeah. the book. And I held on to each of those stories. So yeah. it, it, that book gave back to me as well. well Good magic. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Was the book dedicated to, also to your mother? I seem to remember that. Mm, was no. it or to mother? I, you, no, uh, Charles Vest dedicated Charles Vest, it. Charlie did dedicated it to his it mother. To I dedicated it to Tash, I think. Of course. Because yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> of it's her book. Right. I, 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 it, I couldn't have dedicated it to anybody Anyone else. else. No, it it was so. hers. Beautiful. Any other questions? We've got one at the back there, I can see. And we'll come to you next, if we can. <laughs> Hi, um, Neil, with your exploration of online um, literature, with the uh, interactive storytelling, and Tori, with your uh, musical, The Light Princess, which was absolutely magical, um, are you interested in exploring different creative avenues that you're not immediately comfortable with? I, I love exploring things that I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. Um, and I love doing things that I haven't done yet. There's definitely that, that urge to go, I need to do this because I haven't done one of these yet and it scares me. Um, we've been talking about working together now for 22 years. You don't want really um, to rush these things, do you? And no, don't want to rush. You don't want to rush them. <laughs> but Good things take time. But yeah, I also yeah. think, I mean, one reason why we haven't is because... Because we're friends. We're friends. Yeah. <laughs> and we're but still friends. And we're still friends. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, we've been collaborating for um, ages. We really. have. It's just not, yeah. it's not exactly a not collaboration that anybody thing. can yeah. see. I've no. been, I mean, I, some of Delirium's best lines were stolen from Tori. <laughs> Absolutely and unabashedly stolen. Yeah. And we were it's just, true. We were just saying it's really funny we that share. you'd actually created Delirium before you... Yeah met Tori, but in a way you were kind of summoning her because yeah. she was just saying that actually she kind of really kind of grew into that as well and really loved that character and obviously gave back to it. So Yeah, we would, sure we, we would steal from each other. Yeah. Delirium. The greatest compliment. We'd have fun. Over pizza. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and weird little things that would happen, you know, I do things that would wind up in her songs. I remember one she was having a, a rough time once in Australia. And she found me having had a rough time for various reasons. And I couldn't think what else to do. But I just finished writing a story called Snow Glass Apples. So I said, right, sit down. I'm going to read your story. Mm -hmm. And I read her 6,000-word <laughs> story. I was to paying for that phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, Johnny? <laughs> oh, that's really I'm still paying for that phone <laughs> 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 and Australian phone call rate and, and hotel rates, not just. <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it, wasn't it? Yes, it yes. worth it. Yeah. And it turned up, and it, it turned up in carbon. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you've, you've done the same thing for Neil too. I mean, I, this is what really impresses me most is this, that you're clearly there's a wonderful rapport between you and a, a connection and a support for each other, which I think is a. Fantastic example of friend love, which I believe is a, a term that's being used. But it, it's, have you come across it's this? Lovely. Love, friend I, it, love? It's but it's just thing genuinely, you just connected immediately, you know, even before you met. Honestly, yes. but it's, I think it's wonderful. But, it's, yeah. but it really is, um, you know. You're there for each other. We're best friends. Yeah. And the thing yeah. is, the thing is, um, we've always been best friends, it seems like. Two guys together hanging out, looking at chicks. Or two chicks together, you know, talking about shoes. <laughs> you know? But because that's, our, that's just what, it, what it's always been. We, we were definitely best friends from, we, no, we weren't best friends. We were old friends oh, from the moment yeah. that we met, yeah. which, was, which was very peculiar. And I don't think I've ever done that with anybody else before or since. Just that feeling of, oh, I've known you forever. And, uh, and, and it was this, it, it's the same both ways. And the weird bit about that, is we can go, we can ease, we can we can go months and on a couple of occasions years, and not talk until we need each other, mm -hmm. and then we're on the phone and we're there. And it's I need you yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. Yeah. Question just over here. We stand the microphone just here. Go ahead. Both of you have written about mythology in very unique ways and mythological characters, um, especially Lucifer. Um, I was wondering if you both feel that your conceptions of those characters match up with each other, and if that's something you discuss. 
we've almost never, I, I don't think we either, we, we try particularly to match things up mostly because we also change our minds and do different things. So, I mean, I've done, I've definitely created at least three different Lucifers in my time with different motivations and, and different kinds of stories and may well do some more. Um, Tori's Lucifer was, was something else again and, and, you know, such a beautiful album. Different from Satan, yeah. obviously, mm. Lucifer. And, uh, the light bringer. Yeah, mm. the, the light bringer. And we've talked about that a lot, been fascinated about the angel story. There was a saint Lucifer as well, which I think is just mm. lovely. <laughs> Tell us about that. Is there really no, there, well, yeah, I think he's disappeared. I think he may have disappeared in that great house cleaning. <laughs> um, the dodgy saints. In, in, a, a dodgy saints. I, I love, I, uh, but even, the weirdest things happen even to the real saints. I mean, I mean, there's um, just to get there's the a poem that I was I, I, I was thinking of reading tonight, and now that I'm talking about this, I suppose I, I probably either may or may not, depending <laughs> on the fact that I will give away um, the plot, but. St. Columba um, is one of my favorite saint stories is how he murdered St. Oren. Um, he and he St. And Oren, Columba and St. Oren, landed on the Isle of Iona. They came over from, um, from Ireland and they kept trying to build a church and the church kept collapsing. And St. Columba had a vision that what was needed was obviously to kill St. Oren and bury him in the foundations. <laughs> and that would make it stay upright. So he did. And uh, three days later, feeling a bit guilty, they figured they should probably dig him up and just sort of check on him. <laughs> and uh, so they started digging him up. And St. Oren sat upright. And his eyes opened. And he said, oh my god. I have, I have seen it, and I have had this huge and amazing revelation. And let me tell you, Columba, monks, everybody, hell is not what you think it is. Heaven is not what you think it is, and God is nothing like what we have thought God is. At which point, St. Columba, very sensibly, said, stone the heretic. <laughs> Because obviously, if you've been dead three days and you're coming back to life with, with information of a huge and important kind about death and reincarnation, you just need to be stoned. Uh, so they piled, they piled mud on him and buried him, and he's, he's still there today. And, um, and there's no undis you know, undiscovered writings. Uh, of, of the writings of St. Oren. That's what we want to read, isn't it? He's still there on, yeah. on the Isle of Iona. And Columba was buried briefly on Iona, but then they took him to Downpatrick, where he is buried with... with St. Patrick and St. Bridget. Um, but this is what's kind of weird to me, because I didn't know this story. And I was on Iona years ago, and there was a wonderful, fascinating woman there who was there in the Abbey. And um, somehow I was convinced that she'd killed a man. <laughs> and um, I don't know how all that happened, but she ended it, that song is Twinkle. And so our paths sometimes are crossing each other and we don't even know that they're crossing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how it works. It isn't to answer someone's question. It isn't always, um, it's not planned. You're just following your muses. It's the thing we're talking about. Sometimes you take a journey, you take adventures, you take a pilgrimage. Other people are taking that journey too. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody's work is well known and yours isn't yet, mm -hmm. right, yet, you're still taking the journey. We're all orbiting each other. We're orbiting each other. And part of this is you have to keep stirring it. When I say stirring it, that not in a pejorative way, but in a, um, you know, sort of like uh, nature does. And, and the leaves that she breathes up, breathes and, and gives us, makes a shape with the leaves. That's what we have to do. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the conversations that we've been having now for 23 years. What is that? And they're, they're, they're exactly like that. <laughs> That's true. Sounded pretty convincing to me. Yeah. The science of nature. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Tori, I really wish I could think of a brilliant question for you because I think you're amazing. And it's taken me a lot of memories to take me back to when I could even say that I was 17 yet. But um, Neil, I have a really silly question for you that has kind of long time ago, I went to a discussion with you and you said you were waiting for Futurama so you could be a head in a jar. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't wait. You finally did take Simpsons. Is it because of Alan Moore? Why did you decide to finally um, accept The Simpsons? Why did I? Well, I, I had been um, <laughs> not even slightly subtly going up to Matt Greening um, for at least the last decade. And whenever <laughs> Matt and I would be in the same place at the same time, I'd say, so I want to be ahead in the jar on Futurama. <laughs> and he'd say, you know, we were thinking that maybe you could be a, a cameo in The Simpsons. I'd say, yeah, I want to be ahead in the jar on Futurama. <laughs> and so then um, it got kind of silly, because then Matt Selman from The Simpsons is like, we're, we're going to do a Simpsons episode with you in. I'm saying, but I wanted to be in Futurama. He's like, no, it's really good. Will you do it? I said, well, I guess. Maybe this is my stepping stone to becoming a head in a jar on Futurama. Um, so I, I, I got the script. And um, I'd been expecting it to be a one-line gag, because I'd seen the, the, you know, the episode that Alan Moore and Art Spiegelman and Dan Klaus were in, and they got one line each. You know, that was what they got. So I figured what would probably happen is Homer would say something like, not even Neil Gaiman would think of something this weird. And then you'd <laughs> cut across to me going, you're right, I wouldn't. And that would be, <laughs> that would be my line. And instead, I'm reading it, I'm going, well, I'm in here. And, I'm, and I'm, I've got more lines. And, and I get to the end, it's like, and I'm the bad guy. <laughs> OK, so, so I was completely sold at that point. Um, and then I. I Ever since then, when I've been seeing Matt, and I, I last saw him in Vancouver in March, um, he came to a midnight reading that I did, a midnight ghost tour. And he came over at the end, and he said, that was, that was great. And I said, yeah, head in the jar on future. <laughs> <laughs> it'll happen. It'll happen. I'm sure it'll happen. What's weird is Futurama <laughs> keeps getting canceled, and then it keeps happening some more. So I, yeah, they must get round to it. <laughs> Maybe just here. Uh, yeah, um, I was just wondering. I have to admit that uh, I'm a bit. Uh, I haven't read that much. The few things I read, I was in love with it. Uh, I'll just wonder if. Okay, uh, you also in good relationship or friends with someone like Tim Barton? Actually, I don't know Tim. Um, he's one of the very few people who. That you don't you, know. You, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I know everybody, like three million people in the world. Um, no, I, I, for some reason, and we have friends in common, um, I think we've never worked together probably because he is scared of my hair. <laughs> That's my thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I love his work. And, and I, I did get to work, of course. People, a lot of people think I've worked with Tim Burton mm. because um, they know that I have very obviously worked on Coraline with the director of um, Nightmare Before Christmas, mm -hmm. which was only renamed Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas about a week before it came out, <laughs> which was quite a surprise to Henry Selick, who <laughs> had directed it and um, <laughs> spent the last previous four years of his life making this thing <laughs> and taking it from these sketches by Tim and creating the entire creating the script, creating the story, creating the script, creating the songs, creating the, the look of the characters. Um, and which, which I only thought was a bit unfair when the Coraline posters came out and said, from the director of Nightmare Before Christmas, and people were going, it's an attempt to make us think that Tim Burton directed it. And you're going, no, it's not. <laughs> it's an attempt Actually, to make no, you think no, yeah. that the director of <laughs> Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> so. You've got a question just here. Thank you. Uh, one great bass player, Tony Levin, uh, was asked by a bass player magazine whether he would consider teaching aspiring musicians. And he was umming and eyeing, saying, that's not really what I do. I'm, I'm, um, but if I ever were to take on somebody, I probably wouldn't teach them to play the bass. I would, just, I would probably take them to the kitchen and teach them how to cook proper pasta. Um, you know, 
I think you both get where I'm going with this. If you were taken on an apprentice um, for a day, what would you possibly teach them? Keep it clean. <laughs> 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 I might teach them to keep it clean, but <laughs> you're, I definitely, if I would take you on an apprentice for a day, I wouldn't try and teach them how to write. Um, but I might try and teach them how to read. Or I would love to go, you know, take them for a walk and show them what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing when I go for a walk. Um, that would, that might help. My answer is so much better than his. <laughs> That's because you had the, I was doing the busking thing to give you time. I was giving you time. Yeah, thank you, brother. <laughs> no, you know, on one hand, uh, what I'd say is I think, to be honest with you, this is going to sound weird, but the creative side isn't always the one that challenges people. Why do you think in the music business, besides people stealing records, why do you think there aren't a lot of people that have long careers? And I'll tell you why it is. We were talking about this earlier with people today, is that it's the, it's the discipline. And it's the, um, I was told by journalists today, and I know you hear this all the time, that they have interviewed some musicians who are really rude and because they're tired and they're touring and da 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 da, da. If I hear one more person come up to me and I'm so tired, I've, you feel like giving them your schedule and saying, okay, 17, 18 interviews a day, almost six shows a week. There, there's what I would want to walk somebody through is how much do you want to be an artist? Because part of being an artist is, yes, of course, it's creating. But as he well knows, and the, one of the reasons Neil has the career he has, and, and I have the career I have, creativity is a part of it. But the other part is that we travel, we, we do the interviews. I'm having a blast being here. I want to be here because I'm learning something. You're giving something to us. That's the truth. I'm not just kissing your ass. I'm not. I'm not. I'm learning something. But you have to want to. You have to want to learn something. And if you think that, oh, man, I could be doing this with this shit, man. I, don't, I mean, I, 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 I should be more of an American. Why should I be doing this? I could be shopping. You know, whatever, whatever it is, I didn't mean to just target um, anybody. <laughs> Even all people kinds of who people. like shopping. Yeah, all <laughs> kinds of people. But it's really important that when you do get a little bit of success, because that's how it might start, is that you realize that it's a privilege for somebody to be asking you a question. And what you might want to do is listen to what they have to say. Because being able to hear your story and somebody else's story, I've heard a few people hear their story, and their stories then change the show. Last night's show was different because of the stories I heard in line. But if all you're interested in is your own thing, and we know our gig right now, we're supposed to be talking, but part of the gig is listening. And everybody has a perspective that's worth hearing. Everybody. And sometimes people think, well, I haven't it's almost like the billboard charts of pain, and we've talked about this. If you haven't been through this, 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 and this, and, and a meat cleaver too, <laughs> then, you, then your story isn't worth telling. And we all have to think for a minute, wait a minute, that's not, that's not how inspiration happens and how we inspire each other. Everybody's experience is valid. And some people come up to me and say, well, I don't really want to tell you this, because I've heard the person's story in line before. And then you think, my God, you're already positioning mm. your experience in a pecking order. And so once you start opening it up, you know, you open up and don't judge. You don't start rating, you know, like, like pop charts. You can't do that with human experience. 
And so, yes, Neil kind of trumps us all today because he's been to Syria and he's had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> however, hard to compete with that. However, but however, <laughs> then there's so many stories that I was hearing yesterday, maybe of the personal nature, um, that is completely humbling. And sometimes it's just, I came here, I've lost my job, um, and that's all I have to say, but I need some inspiration. Mm -hmm. And then you start asking questions, and they begin to realize that they do have something to offer. Mm -hmm. There's a great quote we put into the exhibition from Alan Moore from Watchmen, which is simply, there is no ordinary person. No. Oh, there are That's absolutely so none remember. of you are ordinary. <laughs> I want to. How many more questions do we have? <laughs> no, we're actually done. And we're I, out of time. Yeah, and I kind of want to end it there. It's just such a perfect place to end it on yeah. that. And thank you so much all for coming and really thank you so much to our guests. It's a dream oh, come true to have you guys here. Thank you. <laughs>